Okay, so I make it slightly after three o'clock here in uh, in the UK, uh, and would like to say a, a very warm welcome to everybody who's participating in this, the first of our series of Pico webinars. So uh, thank you ever so much for joining. Uh, welcome, and as I said, this is the first in, in a series of webinars that we're going to be running over the next uh, six months as a minimum. So uh, I hope that you find it useful and uh, informative content. So. Before I hand over to uh, the presenters, just a few housekeeping notes. So uh, the webinar will last for approximately 45 minutes, and we intend then to have a questions and answers session uh, at the end. So if you have questions that come up during the presentation, if you can post them, please, in the, in the chat box that you'll all see at the bottom right-hand side of your, your screen. That would be great. Uh, and then we, uh, the presenters, and I will do our very best at the end to, to, to field those questions. So please do feel free to type them as we go. Uh, the webinar is being recorded, so uh, we're recording the audio and uh, video presentation streams, and it's going to be made available after the close of the webinar. So just to make you aware that, that that's going on. Uh, and everybody that's attending, apart from the, the host, which is myself, um, and uh, the presenters is muted and cameras are off by default. So uh, the best way if you want to contact us is to use the, the chat facility. So moving on then to uh, some very brief introdu introductions. Uh, my name is Mike Purday. I am part of the distribution sales team here at Pico. Uh, Presenting the webinar uh, is our business development manager, Trevor Smith, and he's being assisted by two members of our, our engineering team, uh, Stuart and Patty. So Stuart will be giving a, a demonstration of CAN decoding, uh, and Patty will be talking about the, the, the engineering and the science behind our, our broad outreach solution. So uh, as I said, please, I hope you find it enjoyable content. And I'm going to hand over now to uh, Trevor Smith, who is uh, presenting and the, the, the content for the webinar. Uh, Trevor, your floor. Thank you very much, Mike. So um, as, as Mike has said, we've got um, about 45 minutes. We'll, we're looking at the, the evolution of CAN to broad our reach um, networks, uh, automotive networks. And um, I'll be assisted by Stuart Merlis and uh, Patricia Zalag um, at various points. So just to uh, start things off, what I would like to say is a few words about the company. For those of you who have not um, had any dealings with Pico technology before, um, we're a UK company. We're, we're headquartered in a small town called St. Neots, um, fairly close to the Cambridge University town. Um, we were founded in 1991, so um, we've enjoyed since that time 29 years of continuous growth and counting. So uh, financial year runs to the end of June, so we're hoping to make that 30 years um, in the next six months. Um, we produce PC-based test and measurement equipment at fair prices. So we, we, we differentiate ourselves from um, other test and measurement companies in that we do not produce benchtop um, test equipment. Uh, we produce oscilloscopes, data loggers, RF test equipment and the like, but it is all PC based. That is to say it is connected. Uh, the, the, the test equipment is connected to a host computer um, in most cases by a, a USB interface, in some cases a LAN interface, but in any case there is always a PC that acts as the, as the host. Um, we have regional operations both in the United States in a, a town called Tyler near Dallas in Texas and uh, an operation in Asia Pacific as well with um, an office in uh, Shanghai and um, staff in, uh, in Tokyo. We have about 130 employees worldwide and global representation. We're, we're represented in every um, country except Antarctica um, worldwide. So the agenda, um, we'll look first of all at the, at the big picture, what's happening in the, the automotive industry, the mega trends. We'll look back a little bit, at, to take a little bit of a historical perspective as to how um, network topologies have evolved and where they've got to, to date. Um, Stuart will um, 
give us a, a look at our CAN bus um, debugging and analysis solution. Um, we'll look at next generation networks, which is primarily broad R reach, um, Ethernet, 100 base T applications. We'll look at some of the capabilities we've got within our own broad R reach um, solution that operates on the, the Picascope 6000 E series products. And then we'll, we'll have a demonstration of that and we'll take questions, as Mike said, at the end. So the, the, the big picture, this, this um, report, it's a little bit dated now and it's perhaps been affected a, a tad by the coronavirus since it was produced. Um, but nevertheless, the, the automotive market is by, by any standards a huge market um, and significant growth is expected in the next 10 years. And that growth um, is going to be driven by new technologies. So it is expected worldwide that by 2030, um, up to 70% of new cars that are sold will have um, self-driving features. And 15% um, of them um, could be fully autonomous. So autonomous driving technology has the potential to um, reduce holdups, um, dramatically improve road traffic flow. Um, but also to save lives, there are currently around 1.35 million fatal road traffic accidents each year around the world. And actually more than 40,000 in the United States alone, according to insurance statistics. And most of those fatalities are due to human error. And the estimate is that around half of those could be avoided with driverless cars. So it's got the potential to save over, over 600,000 lives each year and associated with that it means that public safety expenditure could also drop and the the savings are estimated there worldwide at around 234 billion dollars each year so there is huge incentive to um, to get this autonomy um, working well um, vehicles are being designed with increasing network connectivity so direct data flow between cars and the wider infrastructure unlocks possibilities, including advanced driver assistance systems, diagnostics, analytical tools, um, enhanced safety features, real-time traffic updates, and rerouting and, and infotainment kind of applications. And then the, th the third big driver is the, the switch to electric vehicles. It's, it's very much underway. Um, <laughs> I'm the proud owner of a Tesla Model 3 myself, and um, I don't think I'll be going back to the uh, the internal combustion engine ever. Um, concerns over climate change have tightened environmental regulations worldwide. Uh, many countries and major cities are aiming to put an end to petrol and diesel engine cars on the road. Um, another factor, perhaps a little bit less relevant to this afternoon's present presentation, but um, urban populations are finding car ownership um, to be increasingly expensive and inefficient. So ride sharing and vehicle sharing are finding more support in the big cities. So vehicle manufacturers are having to invest and adapt um, in order to address those needs. But automotive networks in some way or other are integral to all four of those ACEs, megatrends, as we're calling them. Um, until the 1990s, um, each signal um, between a, a node or an ECU um, was sent across a dedicated cable, um, which um, made for point-to-point -point networks that linked all of the ECUs in a, in a vehicle. Um, however, it is easy to see from the illustration on the top right-hand side here um, that uh, an ECU at any network needs to communicate to multiple ECUs, the cabling requirements rapidly escalate. So in this simple network of only five um, ECUs, there are 25 dedicated cables that are required to link them. So it, it, it rapidly becomes, it's not really a, a scalable um, way of, of building things. So the need to reduce the amount of wiring in vehicles um, led manufacturers in the late 80s, early 90s to develop in-vehicle buses where multiple cables 
um, are replaced by a single cable that may itself contain one or more individual wires. And data from different nodes on the network is serially multiplexed onto a single signal, which can then be transmitted on the one cable. Um, one of the earliest and um, most widely de deployed automotive serial bus networks is the CAN bus or controller area network, um, which was developed in the mid 1980s by Robert Bosch, GmbH. Um, and the intention was to develop a high speed and reliable communication system between multiple ECUs. Um, but one that was without the need for any host controller. Um, CAN 2.0 was introduced in 1991 and was first implemented in production by Mercedes in the early 1990s. And it was ultimately standardized as ISO 11898 in 1993. Many different network protocol standards have emerged. Um, each one is designed to take advantage of emerging semiconductor technologies and optimized for some combination of communication speed, cost, the weight of the wiring in particular, uh, robustness and reliability, so redundancy and compatibility with um, previous generations. Um, so there's a lot of design trade-offs that take place in the design of those, in the choice and the design of those networks. Unfortunately, ease of design debug is not usually high on the list of requirements. So it's tended to be true that each successive generation tends to be tougher to debug and requires more advanced tools. Um, vehicle networks, uh, they obviously have to be designed and thoroughly simulated at, at every level. Um, the hardware also needs to be thoroughly stress tested across worst case conditions to ensure the reliable operation once the vehicle is deployed in the market. Protocol analyzers like the CANU system from Vector Informatic are ideal for that function. And they can be configured with something, something called option.scope, which in fact is an OEM version of the Picascope 5444D um, to address every layer in the OSI stack. But what we're focusing on in this presentation is debug and analysis of the physical layer. In other words, the waveforms that make up the bits and the bytes of the, of the data transmission. So what I'd like to do now is hand over to Stuart Merlis, who will give us a, a short demonstration of our CAN bus um, decoding capability on Picascope. Good afternoon, my name is Stuart Merlis, an FAE here at Pico Technology. In this demonstration, we are going to acquire and decode multiple frames of CAN data using the Picoscope 6 serial decoding tool, one of many protocols that is available as standard in the Picoscope 6 software. To set up, what I will do is go into my tools menu and select serial decoding and then select create. You'll see we have series of standard serial protocols including broad r reach can and can fd now if i go into my settings uh, you'll see my specific settings for this particular setup uh, the threshold the hysteresis and the board rate as you can see on the screen we have can high and then we also have the darker purple trace is can low and then, of course, we have the differential, both CAN and CAN low, the difference between CAN high and CAN low. Viewing the difference between the two removes any common mode interference encountered by the signal during transmission. Now, as you can see, we are decoding data and we can look through the colored packets. So the orange, if I hover my mouse over the orange, you can see that's packet five. Um, that is the arbitration field. If I move over to the green, 
that's my control field and of course we've got the data field and right at the end of the frame we have our end of frame data going down into the table view you can see we've got our uh, identifier there and we've also got our remote transmission request we've also got our DLC code so there are multiple um, information in tabular form available for you to look at through your um, serial decoding table view thank you very much for listening Yeah, thank you, Stuart. So um, that's an example of just how easy it is to see the uh, the, the frame contents and the the, the decoded packets in, in a CAN bus uh, communication using Picascope. Um, the the point is here that correlation of the uh, the data in those packets to the signal that is being transmitted really is the key to to being able to debug a network effectively. If you can see um, an error in terms of the data that's being transmitted and then correlate that to a signal integ integrity problem, a um, crosstalk, overshoot, rise time problem, or, or whatever it may be, uh, race hazard or something like that, then the, the correlation of the two is what enables engineers to get to the root cause of, um, of problems in their networks as rapidly as possible. So that's CAN bus. It's uh, very, very widely deployed um, on, in today's cars and, and continues to be, of course, with CAN FD. There are faster versions um, of that. Um, looking forward at kind of to where we are and to, um, to where we're heading, um, the next generation of vehicles will undoubtedly process absolutely enormous amounts of data compared to, to what we've dealt with in the past. So um, <laughs> I mentioned the, uh, the Tesla, the one that I, there's a picture that I took yesterday morning um, as I was uh, driving to the office here in St. Neitz. Um, so I, I had the, the auto drive on, it's not a great picture, unfortunately, but um, it was the best I could do while I was driving the car. Um, but of course, I, I didn't need to spend too much time looking at, at where I was going because the, the car was doing a lot of the, the work for itself. So multiple cameras, radar, LIDAR, and numerous other sensors um, all have to be processed in order to deliver the promise of these um, driverless vehicles and, and today the, the advanced driver assistance systems. Um, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to transport infrastructure um, communications is is to come um, so that's that's something that's very much on the horizon and as I mentioned earlier the the cost and the weight of the the vehicle harnesses is, is always an issue um, the, when manufacturers are desperate to keep the both the weight and the cost to a minimum so the solution that has been broadly adopted across the industry is is that of broad R reach and you, you can think of it as automotive ethernet so broad R reach is is now um, an open alliance it's called the, the open alliance broad R reach um, physical transceiver uh, specification it's been standardized as IEEE um, P802-3 BW so and it's the, the the one that we're looking at today is the 100 base T1 standard. So it benefits enormously from the economy of scale from technology that is already widely used in office and other um, networking applications. Um, but it, it addresses the additional requirements in vehicles for hostile automotive um, applications whilst meeting that requirement for low cost, low weight um, using an unshielded twisted uh, pair copper cable. So the, the cable that it uses isn't the, um, the networking cable that you're familiar with in office applications. It's, it's this thin 
um, pair of, of twisted copper cable that, um, that is used to transmit the signals. So the broad R-reach physical layer um, looks a bit like this. So we have the, 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 twisted, uh, the twisted pair cable that we can see and we can access. So if we want access to look at the signals that are going on the, on the signal, then we've got points that we can readily access at the, um, at the input and, well, at the, at the I.O. of the transceiver. Um, at each end, um, and then there is the the phi, the physical layer uh, part of the transceiver, and the and the MAC, which is effectively um, standard Ethernet um, MAC interface. Now the problem that we have is that, as I say, the the networking doesn't look like this that you see top left, which is what you will have been familiar with using Cat5 cable in a, in an office network. It is just a single twisted pair wire. So, um, and it's bi directional, it's full duplex. So, and we don't normally have access to what's going on in here. So, our test access points are here and here, um, but we need to know what's, um, what's being uh, transmitted in each direction to make sure that the, the transmissions are good. So, we need some tools in order to achieve that. So what I'd like to do now is to introduce to you um, Patty, Patty Zelag, who will take us through some of the characteristics of the broad R reach physical layer. Patty. Thank you, Trevor. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, so before we can discuss uh, broad R reach decoder and the packet structure, I would like us to go through uh, some signal characteristics to get familiar with to, to know uh, how to, how did we actually get to the decoding data? So broader reach, as Trevor mentioned, is based on the uh, 100 base DX uh, D, uh, decoder at Ethernet a standard. Actually, it's 100 base uh, T1. And uh, this adaptation employs PAM3 encoding. PAM stands for Pulse Amplitude Modulation, uh, which means that the signal data, the signal values are encoded in numer numerous pulses, where in order to know the value of the sample, you would need to probe its amplitude. And PAM3, the, the three, the second part, means that uh, in PAM3, in this adaptation, we've got only three individual le layers, levels, uh, that the signal can get. So in here, we can see uh, I diagram, which is usually used for the uh, intersymbol interference uh, characteristics, finding the characteristics. Uh, and you can see three distinctive la layers, levels uh, that the signal took uh, low or minus one, middle, uh, null, or uh, and uh, high, which is a one plus one. So um, going forwards, we know that one symbol uh, can take all these uh, three different uh, lay levels. So if we pair them together, so if we take two uh, individual symbols and pair them together, we've got three times three number of combinations, which is nine. So a pair can encode nine different possible uh, combinations. So if we discard one just to get eight, um, which is two to the power of three, uh, that that would mean that three different bits of the information can be encoded by two of the symbols. And that's basically uh, how the, the packet is being decoded. Um, each symbol is transferred with 66.6 uh, .6 megahertz, so the pair would take 33.3 .3 megahertz. Uh, so if you multiply it by three, that is uh, 100 megabits per second. So that's the speed of the transmission uh, that PAM3 or broader reach uh, can transmit. So um, it's uh, it's good at uh, like, why was it chosen to, to get uh, implementation in the automotive industry? And that's because it can operate with a low quality cabling uh, without compromising the, the filtering and uh, the high levels of filtering and also to provide improved emissions and noise immunity. Um, okay. So that's looking from uh, 
single file, single endpoint perspective. perspective. So uh, each endpoint emits PAN3 signal. But because this uh, is a full duplex decoder of full, full duplex transmission, bidirectional, all these PAN3 signals are adding up together. So in the end, if we were measuring the signal at one endpoint, this is more or less what we could uh, see on the screen uh, of the scope. So we've got here two channels. One was uh, probably the signal at uh, closer uh, on the transmission line, closer to master, channel A on the top, and channel D on the bottom is closer to, to slave. And you can see that there's nothing that looks like PAM3 signal. Uh, it's more closer to PAM5, obviously uh, it's not, not the same, but um, that, that information can't be uh, decoded because you can't predict which combination was uh, transmitted at a given time on the given sample. Um, so usually how uh, industry copes with that, uh, that situation, that problem, they use uh, what's called a directional coupler. And on the right hand side, we've got an example of Rosenberger uh, uh, solution and that uh, device is usually inserted in the system on the transmission line and it allows to separate uh, both endpoints uh, communication in order for further inspection and investigation. Obviously such uh, solution interferes heavily with the system, uh, produces a bias and that's not uh, in, uh, desirable. Uh, so our engineering team was kind of interested in Aside to creating a decoder, which we would deal with a PAM3 signal, could we actually also achieve a semi-similar a, a semi, a solution to this hardware directional coupler, but in the software? So first thing, and it's also visible on this graph on this picture, uh, is that uh, probing two different endpoints, you're, you're just probing to the same communication. So basically you should see if not identical, but very close to identical signal on both ends, right? Why is it so different? And that's that's what's, um, what's called a velocity of propagation. It's a, a physics or electronics uh, measure that uh, defines a delay of uh, a, a signal propagation in the cable relative to the speed of life in the vacuum. And uh, we took that a measurement and we thought, okay, maybe that's that's uh, a key to, to developing a solution. And that's actually after a, a couple of experimentation and the white paper that is going to be quoted later, employing also the um, spectrum analysis, we uh, actually achieved a software directional coupler. And that solution is available for you uh, on, in Picoscope 6. Um, also in Picoscope 7 uh, under math channels uh, and it should work uh, and it, it does work uh, on any full duplex uh, communication. So it's not bound to broader reach. You can't use it on any uh, full duplex bidirectional communication to separate out both channels. What obviously you need to have is these uh, signals. So two probes that would probe the signal on uh, two ends of the communication or not even ends like you know you need to know the distance that the probes were inserted uh, apart because obviously if we are going to use this velocity of propagation uh, measure you need to know the distance that the velocity was uh, that the delay was propagated within so in here uh, we know that it was the last parameter it's two it was two meter apart uh, that the probes were inserted probing the system um, and a cat five is the closest that we could find on the tables uh, for the uh, constant that were measured that uh, for VOPs uh, to represent to be the closest to the twisted pair uh, used in the broader reach. So if we if we go to this exercise, uh, so the VOP for uh, for our example is uh, if we insert this uh, 0.66 constant and multiply it by speed of light, which is three times to 10 to the power of eight uh, meters per second, we should get around five nanoseconds delay uh, every meter of the cable for the transmission. Okay, so 
we had our uh, tangle mangled uh, signal with full duplex communication. We ran them through a software directional coupler, or if you happen to have hardware directional coupler, then this is what you're supposed to see on either of the uh, of the probing endpoints. Uh, so now we could employ uh, employ the actual decoder. So similarly to CAM decoder, you can find them under tools in the top ribbon of Picoscope 6, selecting serial decoding option, clicking create button, which will, should bring you uh, the whole list of all possible, all implementation for decoders that we, uh, we have in the offer for our zero decoding palette, select broader reach, and that should bring you the end of like a configuration for this particular decoder to be set up to decode your data. Uh, so in this instance, we used math channels. So uh, as a source uh, for the channel should be your PAM3 signal. It could be either a coupler or, or the signal that you measure with the hardware coupler. Uh, also under configuration, we've got three values. Uh, first two are the threshold, uh, the high threshold where all the data above this threshold should be treated as a level high and low threshold similarly for uh, low. And the last option is uh, refers to something that I haven't mentioned yet uh, that relates to the phi to actual hardware. Uh, and it relates to the scrambler. Scrambler is a little device that uh, it sits before the phi and it inverts the inverts the bits uh, in a pseudo random uh, manner. And that's not that's obviously for obfuscation purposes. So when you observe the data, when you when you inspect the transmission line, you, it's not obvious to the uh, to the inspector, to the, to the user. Uh, what is what this transmission line was uh, trans like uh, carrying? So aside to the obfuscation, it also uh, avoids a concentration of a specific frequencies within uh, the transmitted data spectrum, and that's uh, important uh, because uh, if if that didn't happen, it might uh, might lead to something that is called uh, intermodulation or uh, cross modulation. And um, so it's an interference with adjust, uh, adjusting the channels um, that may interfere within the system and it's not desired. So anyway, so that, that option, because master and safe or uh, receiver, transmitter and receiver have different order of the scrambler. So the register is different, uh, the, the, the length of the register. So if you select master, that was the transmission uh, coming from the master. And that's for our decoder a hint which descrambling technique order we should uh, use underneath the hood. So coming, uh, we've decoded the data and that's basically how the packet looks like uh, in a zoomed in uh, manner because the payload, the very last bit is quite long. Uh, so the, the first bits are uh, the synchronization pattern which is called preamble. It's always fixed, it's always the same. And the fun, like, interesting fact about this is uh, whenever the, the packet is being transmitted, uh, because the, the, when you inspect the, when you inspect the transmission line, you can see that the PAM3 or the, the obviously added together PAM3, uh, depending which, whether you're probing the hardware, hardware coupler output or the row uh, transmission line, you would see the signal come like because of the scrambler, like it, it looks like it was always transmitting data, but it's not the case. So for, for the receiver to understand when actual uh, transmission is happening, uh, it's uh, when we could see the six consecutive zeros and that's uh, from the TX uh, enabled pin going high. And when that pin goes high, there are like three, uh, there are six different, six consecutive, sorry, uh, zeros uh, appended as part of this preamble to mark the beginning of the packet that it's being transmitted so the other end can uh, start listening. So, okay, we've got this uh, preamble, then we've got uh, Mac, uh, Mac source, Mac uh, destination, and different other properties of the uh, of the packet, which are uh, optional depending on what was actually transmitted. But that would vary depending on the system what was actually transmitted. 
uh, and the payload. So that's the graphical option uh, that uh, if you if you tick bo the box to display the adornments on the graph, uh, the decoded adornments, this is what you would see. But there was also similarly to Canvas a table display. So it's the same uh, information that they would be displayed on the graph presented in the tabular form. So uh, for you, uh, so you can uh, harvest this information or, or do some processing of this information for your own needs. So uh, obviously you can hide some um, columns that are just uh, not, not of interest to you and just leave the ones that are that are important. Adjust the grid si size so uh, it is uh, you can read it comfortably. You can filter through uh, the table to just leave leave the packages that uh, the, the packets that are uh, the ones that you're interested in and also search through them you can apply mix these combinations of feature as you as you like the other friend ones as well i'm not going to talk about uh, them i will leave them just for you to explore our software is free so you can download it and play with it as you like and i encourage you to that to do that so that was a very short summary, very condensed. I know that there was a lot of uh, probably new uh, terminology. I invite you to to go to use Google to to learn more. It's quite interesting, uh, interesting topic. And I must assure you that that was the most challenging uh, decoder that we've ever built at Pico. And we will see how it goes uh, further. But yeah, uh, thank you very much for listening. And I'm giving back the voice to Trevor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patty. Much appreciated. So, okay, so what we're going to do now is just wrap up with a, a very quick, um, well, not that one, a very quick. Uh, yeah, that's, thank you, Mike. So we've got, we've got now the, the picture on, the, the live picture from my display on, on my PC. And what I'm showing to begin with, it's, Unfortunately, the, the presentation speed is not keeping up anywhere near as fast as the actual speed that, that I can see on the, on the screen here myself. But, um, but no, no matter, we'll, we'll push on. So what we're looking at here is, um, to begin with, is one signal. So it's the signal, um, the differential signal taken from the, the master device. On the, so we've got two transceivers set up here, one as a master, one as a slave. There's a, uh, a length of cable, a length of twisted pair cable between them of um, about 1.72 meters. And we've got each end um, probed differentially. So if I speed the, uh, the time base up a little bit, um, yeah, for me now it's going quite quickly, but it's not, um, I can see on the, on the presentation, and we, we're limited by the bandwidth of the internet, I guess. So if I freeze that for a moment and just stop it, um, I think we can agree that attempting to resolve that as a PAM3 uh, waveform for decoding would be pretty much impossible. We can use the rulers to um, look at minus a volt, plus a volt. So there are... There are some parts of the signal that are clearly ones, some that are clearly minus ones. There's a lot in between, um, but the, the interference on the signals from, tra from the traffic going in each direction um, makes it impossible. It would be really difficult to distinguish whether that was really a minus one or a zero. And you know who knows what's happening in here. The, the collision of the signals in each direction is, is making that impossible. Um, if I turn that on and then turn on, just just for a bit of extra fun, turn on an extra channel. Um, so so now we're we're seeing the on the same line. We're seeing the differential signal. Where one is captured at the master end, the other is captured at the slave end. And clearly, wh whether we were trying to do that um, in a manual fashion by eye. Or whether we were trying to automate it in some way, we, it, it's pretty well impossible to see what's going on. So the the last part of that then is if I just 
add the output of the coupler and I'll clear a little bit of space. So this orange trace here is the output from the coupler. Um, run it live again. So it's with, with the coupler, it's much easier to, to see whether a, a signal is, is above or below a, a particular threshold, either, either the high threshold or the, or the low threshold. Um, the, the, the decoder has got something meaningful to work with um, once, it's, uh, once it's been processed using that um, software coupler. So then just to finish up on that, um, this is what the decoded waveform looks like. Now we've kind of cheated here a little bit because in, in this capture, um, what we did, we very, very carefully and delicately, we attached some wires to the, the Mac device, the, the device I said that um, ordinarily, you would not have access to. So in this captured waveform here, we, we did do exactly that. Um, it was not an easy task. It had to be done under a, a powerful microscope with somebody with soldering skills and eyesight that um, neither of which I possess. So anyway, you can see the, um, the, the two waveforms here. So there is the using the, uh, the software coupler, we have um, coupled in order to look at the master to slave waveform, the slave to master waveform going the other direction. And then we've looked at the same information here on the Mac device, which typically you would not have access to. And then if I zoom in a little bit here, we can see the, um, the packet in, in very much the same way that, um, that Patty um, just described. And uh, there we are, there are the, the, um, the, the, the sequence of zeros there that start the packet and then the, the, the preamble and the payload. And that's, um, that's looking at, uh, at one packet, um, which for, for looking at signal integrity problems is probably the way that you would want to look at that information. Um, if you're looking for data errors, then the way to look at it would be to, to turn on the, um, the tabular uh, readout, the table format readout, and then you can easily see what's um, what's going on line after line after line of that captured data. So that you can see in this case, um, there are some um, there are some good packets, but there are also some packets where um, errors have been injected. And if they don't pass the criteria, if they if the if the CRC doesn't um, doesn't match. Or, or some other error condition um, is highlighted, then those um, those error packets are highlighted in red. And if I double click on that one, for instance, we click there, and we can go immediately to see what the um, what the packet containing that error was. More than that, it's it's a very similar approach to the way that Stuart showed us with the CAN bus. Uh, decoding. We we capture the signals, we look at the data, we correlate errors, the data errors with um, with signal integrity issues. And that, that is the essence of, um, of decoding these broad R reach networks. So what I'd like to do now is just go back to the um, to the main presentation and um, just to summarize a few of the things that we've seen. So oh yes, so in the in the demonstration that you just saw, th this was the setup. So we we're using we were using a couple of these fiber code transceivers here, and um, you can just about see on there some of the <laughs> the very delicate wiring that went onto the side of that phi chip. So some really delicate wires that had to be attached here that um, wouldn't normally be possible. So these are um, USB powered. Um, transceivers for broad R reach with the, the 1.7 meters of cable in between the two. And then you can't see it there, but I can see it here that the, the master was flashing with a, a blue light and the, the slave with a, uh, 
a green light here. And then we're using these two um, differential probes to probe the, um, the, the, the PAM3 signal at, at each end. So that was the, the, the demo setup. So um, you then may be asking, well, what is the what are the hardware requirements in order to examine these um, broad RH signals? And the answer is that uh, you would need a Picoscope 6000, a 6000 E series scope. There are a few models um, with bandwidth from 300 to 500 megahertz. Um, five giga samples per second sampling, flexible resolution with um, eight, 10 or 12 bits resolution, and a, a massive capture memory of up to four giga samples. Um, the scope needs to be matched with a pair of differential probes. So the, the ones that we're recommending here would be the AD2201, 200 megahertz, or better, the AD2801, 800 megahertz differential probes. You need two of those. So those are the, the hardware requirements. And as Patty hinted, um, we, we haven't actually got a slide on the software requirements because the, the, the software requirements are, are, are simply included with the standard issue Picoscope 6 software. And um, soon to come, the, the Picoscope 7 software that, uh, that our development team are working on now. So the, you, the, the, the requirements in, in cost terms are effectively the, the cost of the, of the scope and the, the pair of differential probes. So to summarize then, uh, Picoscope PC-based instruments are general purpose scopes, um, but they are equipped as standard with advanced features for analysis and debug of um, many um, protocols, in, including the ones that we've seen this afternoon. So there's 21 serial protocol protocol decoders included currently as standard with, uh, with more in development that um, we will uh, release as they, uh, as they come through. Um, broad our reach with the inbuilt software directional coupler and the scopes have free updates for the lifetime of the instrument. So as, as we develop new capabilities, it gets um, incorporated into the Picoscope, Picoscope 6 software and is available for free of charge download for the lifetime of the instrument. Um, I've got some pricing down here. We've got them in euros. Um, so the, the entry level Picoscope uh, 6000 is the Picoscope 6403. E, it is the, the 300 megahertz four channel um, fixed eight bit resolution scope. Um, that's a little over 4,000 euros. The AD2201 is about 1,000 euros and you need two of them. And realistically, you, you probably would, would take benefit from the digital pods. So eight, eight digital channels to, if you want to look at that, um, uh, that Mac information that we showed there, um, that's about 600 euros there. We do have on our um, website a, um, a white paper on serial bus decoding. If you go into picotech.com and then into our library and look at uh, the A to Z of Picoscopes and hit the letter B for broad R reach, in, in that article is the link to, um, to our, our white paper on automotive serial buses. Sorry, it's slightly convoluted and we haven't put it on the slide here, but um, uh, yeah, library, A to Z of Picoscopes, broad R reach, and uh, you'll find it there. So that concludes the, um, uh, the, the webinar. We've, we've five minutes or so over time, but we will at this point take any questions. So we'll we'll have a look back. I'll have a look back now to see what. Um... So Trevor, I've got the uh, I've got the questions. So thank okay. you very much indeed for the presentation. That was brilliant, and thank you both to Patty and to Stuart for their uh, their, their participation as well. So that's great. So uh, we've got three questions that have come in through chat. So. Brian asked, when was Broad R Reach deployed by manufacturers and who is currently using it? 
Oh, um, I haven't got a, uh, a definitive list. It's, uh, I mean, the, I mean, we started seeing designs for broad R reach probably f four or five years ago, maybe six years. There is a, um, there is a list on the web that Stuart's kindly uh, given me. So I'll click on that list. Uh, the, this is the list of, um, of manufacturers that have adopted it. It's pretty, pretty wide. Um, so we're seeing uh, BMW, uh, Hyundai. Well, actually, this is a mix of, of vehicle manufacturers uh, and uh, ECU manufacturers. So B BMW, Broadcom, of course, as the originators of the standard, Freescale, Harman, which make the Incara uh, infotainment systems, Hyundai, NXP, uh, STM Microelectronics, and more. So that's um, that's the the start. There there are many others. The um, Tesla, of course, the, the Tes most of the Tesla models um, are are built around um, broad R reach. Um, there are many others, but I think a, a search of the of the web would reveal more than I can um, reel off off the top of my head. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Trevor. So the second question is a fourth question has just come in as well. Uh, the second question came in from Ari, uh, and this might be one for Patty to answer. Uh, it says, can the waveform decoding do continuous capture, in brackets, log all messages, uh, or are there dead times between acquisitions? So uh, in our uh, in our scope, in our software, PicoScope 6 and 7 uh, uses, and also SDK, uses two different modes. One is called block mode, and the other one is streaming. So block mode uh, captures a block of data and displays them on the screen, and then block another block of data and displays them on the screen. Whereas uh, a streaming uh, just streams continuously the number of samples over uh, uh, and, and prints them on the screen as, as it goes, as, as the acquisition as the buffer is being filled with the samples. So it is possible. So there are like two questions in one. So it is possible to capture continuous uh, continuous signals, uh, and uh, and whether it is possible to decode them. Yes. It so it's all boiling down to uh, because our our software is uh, run on the PC. So it depends on your PC uh, strength. Uh, how powerful is your, your machine? Because there's a lot of computation calculations power needed. Uh, so what is advisable usually is if you're interested in the streamed data in the co one continuous block of data. So you should capture the data first, stop the capture, uh, either using single trigger, for instance, so it automatically stops it and just captures one one big block of data, and then apply the post. Uh, processing of any kind, whether it's a coupler uh, or whether it's a, a broader reach decoder or any decoder, any post-processing in general. Uh, so that way, uh, like you're not hammering uh, your PC power so much. But yes, so it is possible, but depends on your PC strength power. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Patty. Uh, and another question also from Ari. Uh, can the logging show both directions of communication separated and marked, e.g. master stroke slave? I, so I, I can take that one as well. So, uh, so unfortunately, all of our decoders only output one, uh, one information stream. So obviously here with the, with the coupler, uh, you you are trying to untangle or untangle two-way communication. So you've got two signals, but the output is always one. So in order to um, to get the information coming from both directions, you unfortunately would need to uh, set up the coupler twice, uh, reversing the the argument. So uh, so it can like run the coupler in the reverse direction and that way you can set up the decoder around the 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 coupler output so it is yes it is possible but unfortunately you would need to uh, set it up separately because of our architecture this is how how we designed it uh, before and this is how uh, how we keep it uh, consistent yeah. If I can add something there, um, Patty. So, the it was what in fact was going on in in the 
signal that I was showing, um, I was looking at both the, at the communication in both directions. It just happened that the, the, the packet that I captured was master to slave and the, the slave to master packet was, was somewhere far away. But it, it you know, by, as Patty says, by, by setting up two decoders, one, one for each direction, um, yeah, it, it will put it on the screen. Absolutely. And it's applicable not only to broader reach to any decoder. So if you, if you happen to have multiple signals and th that uh, would require multiple decoders, you can set up multiple de decoders and observe them on the screen as, they, as the communication goes on. OK, wonderful. Thank you, Patty. I'm going to answer There's some more questions come in. I'm going to answer them slightly out of sync because there's three that I can answer reasonably quickly. Uh, and then there's two more for, for our technical team in the office. So uh, a question from Steve, where will we be able to see the replay? Uh, so the replay is hosted via live webinar and live webinar use Amazon servers, but we will also be putting the video up on uh, YouTube. So we'll make sure that everybody gets the um, gets the, the, the recording link uh, as soon as possible. Uh, a question from Alan, which says, who is your target market for this? Surely not our workshop text. No, this is not a this is not an automotive uh, application for use in a garage. This is very much um, designed for people who are looking at R&D or um, design and uh, development for future cars. So uh, or, you know, modifications to existing cars. So this is this is um, very much a test measurement application, uh, but aimed at automotive manufacturers or, or designers or people working in, in the automotive space, uh, as opposed to people actually working in garages. Uh, and a question from Christian, which says, is it possible to decode broad R reach with a 5444D 200 megahertz peak scope, or do you need one of the 6000 E scopes? And the answer to that, as Trevor uh, touched on earlier in the presentation, is you do need uh, a 6000 series scope for the uh, for the bandwidth and for the memory depth that, that this decode uh, requires. So, uh, two more questions for our, our our panel of experts, please. So, John asks, what are typical bandwidth requirements for oscilloscopes in the automotive space? Uh, Trevor, perhaps you'd like to take that one. Uh, yes, yeah, thank you. It it relates really to the previous answer. So, uh, th three hundred megahertz um, is the minimum bandwidth and back but it's it, it needs to be backed with a decent sampling speed as well to get it to get a good sig single shot capability so the uh, it works it works fine with our 6403e so 300 megahertz and uh five giga samples per second sampling captures the the waveform nicely um but not not below that so the the five triple four d previously mentioned it's got 200 megahertz bandwidth but a sampling speed of a giga sample per second um that uh, that does doesn't hack it okay wonderful thank you uh, another question from uh, ari saying is there a difference between 100 base t1 and broad r reach and if there is can this setup be used for both it's the same thing it's the same thing thank you Okay, that's good. Uh, and then a question from Sven, uh, who says, great presentation, thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to, to the team. Uh, any plans to incorporate more debugging functionality into PicoScope, like what I've seen with the Warwick software demo? I'm not aware of vendor you mentioned during presentation that is using 5444D, but I'll look at their offerings. Um, as an owner of PicoScope hardware and doing a bit of CAN debugging, I'd like to see some of their functionality in these programs in PicoScope. Well, I think we, we would need to understand a little bit more about what the, the, the Warwick software demo uh, incorporates. Uh, but Sven, if you'd like to get in touch with us um, off, offline, then uh, you'd be most welcome. I'll send you my email address in the, in the, in the chat. Uh, that's perhaps something we can we can pick up um, offline. Could, could, could I jump in a little bit there as well, Mike? So Please do. just to say that we, we do work pretty closely with a, um, a few other vendors. So yep, we are um, aware of Warwick, but the, we, we have a very close partnership with Vector Informatic that produced the Canoe um, suite of debug tools that is uh, is used for looking at um, other layers in the stack. So for looking at um, protocol analysis on um, automotive buses, 
can traditionally, but um, increasingly now brought our reach. Um, so, and, and they have adopted the, the 5444D as, um, as their scope. So if you want to look at the waveforms that are underneath the protocol analysis that they're doing, then the, um, you know, we are very familiar with that particular solution. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much indeed, Trevor. Um, there's a couple of other people typing, so uh, we'll hold on for a couple more minutes if there are other questions coming through. Um, so Edwin says, thank you, well done. Uh, and Sven says also, thank you for answering. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure. And I put my email address uh, into the chat. Um, so if anybody has any offline questions, please feel free to, to forward them to me and I'll, I'll make sure that they reach the right people. Uh, Ari says, thank you for all this info. I've been debugging systems like this uh, and expect to do some 100 base T1 in the future, but probably intercepting the CPU stroke Mac points, not yet the cable. Uh, so Patty, any comments on that? Um, not really. I don't know. I've been, uh, sorry, I would need to, I didn't understand that there was a question. I think that what Ari's saying is he's looking at doing some, some broad R reach decoding, but intercepting the CPU dash Mac points, not yet the cable. Um, so I suspect that's that's perhaps a slightly different um, twist on it. Uh, and, and again, Ari, please feel free to reach out if, you, if you've got more questions. And if you're looking to do broad R reach decoding in the future, obviously we'd be delighted if you were to buy a Picascope 6000E with which to do it. Uh, so Simon says, does the amount of twist in the, wire. in the wire affect the propagation velocity oh that's a very technical question <laughs> i don't think it does th th thinking thinking back to my college days i think it does a little bit but um you know most most twisted pair cables come off the the reel they look like that and a little bit more or a little bit less it it won't make enough difference to um to upset the the coupler okay wonderful thank you both i think that is exactly. the last that's the last question we've we've had come in uh well he actually in fact simon simon says thank you very much um and his question related to beyond measurable limits so i, I think I, that, that's right <laughs> uh, yeah i think we, we we've, we've addressed that so uh with that, I will uh, declare the meeting closed or the webinar closed and, and just thank you again, once again, to everybody who's attended. Uh, I hope you found that useful. And thanks again very much indeed to to, to our panel, for Trevor, for, for uh, essentially presenting the core of the, the, the information and to Patty and to Stuart for their uh, their contributions. So thank you very much indeed, everybody. <laughs>